Uh, good evening and thank you uh, very much for coming. Uh, it will get a bit irreverent later. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you 10 rather boring minutes for those of you who might be upset about the lack of information you might get later. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's a warning, that's, that's, that's coming first. Um, cycling capital. I haven't actually checked Oxford ever was the cycling capital, uh, I, in case it wasn't. Uh, I like to think of it as the cycling capital because I grew up here and in the 1970s there were bikes everywhere. It wasn't just bikes in the middle that you see now, there were bikes all the way around the edge on the ring road. Most of the workers in the car plant were getting to the car plant on bike uh, because they didn't have a car. So one day I'll have to look at the 71 census and see whether we did beat Cambridge back then. Uh, but, but we may have done. And of course we have this history uh, of, of bikes before the car. Bikes are older than cars in, and you're a civic society. Um, if you're making an argument for why the city needs space for more bikes, you are making an argument about keeping the historic look of a city. This was never a city designed uh, to fit cars uh, within it and there is no easy way of fitting cars and buses into, into medieval uh, cities. Whereas bikes, uh, for the, it's, it's contested, I, I learned when I looked this all up, but next year may well be the 200th anniversary of the one with two wheels that you kind of balance on. Uh, now here's, here's the boring part. It's, it is new. Uh, Beth and Thomas and I have an atlas of Britain coming out in April and we've tried to map change in uh, everything that you can map and one of these things is cycling. Uh, this is the most boring slide. Um, this is the kind of thing that my job involves. It involves reading obscure memos for the Office of National Statistics which say, whoops we made a mistake, we got the data wrong, uh, here's the re-release of the data. And so we've had these actual correct numbers about how people travel, in this case, to work only since 2014. And most people didn't know about it till 2015 when we tried to compare the rates and it made no sense. I won't bore you rigid, but we do actually do some real work <laughs> apart from just waving our hands around. Anyway, having taken that into account, and it's all to do with really annoying home workers and those of you who might... They're not annoying, they're nice. Um, <laughs> But of course, sometimes they cycle to somewhere else while they're home workers. Or some of you may take a car and drive to the edge of Oxford and then take a bike and cycle in. And then when somebody asks, how do you go to work? You think, I'm a cyclist. Whereas in fact, you've driven most of the journey in a car. You've got to learn this map very quickly. <laughs> uh, there's a challenge. This, this is a stretched map uh, where every area is drawn in proportional to the people. So anything we show on this map we're actually not hiding people. Most people uh, live in cities in the south. They live in London or in Birmingham or in Oxford in the middle. And I'm going to show you the rate at which people cycle in each area. Now, this is the rate for the entire population, not what you see for commuters. It doesn't include school children uh, in England, uh, but it's a pretty good estimate of, of the entire population from the census. And it's not high. This is central London. And this is the kind of Hoxduff, trendy, hipster part of London. And there you're getting 5 to 14%. This is our rival Cambridge, which is beating us. And there we are. Uh, this is Bristol, this is Exeter, this is down Southampton. For most of the country, particularly out of London, you're looking at less than 1% of people are, are cycling. So one reason uh, for increasing cycling here is because it is actually not high anywhere else and it would be a good idea if more people cycled. Uh, in the Netherlands, half the population cycle a walk to get to work. 25% of pensioners are cycling, whereas in the UK it's 1% of pensioners. I've only got two tables as figures for you. This is the league table. So the winner at the moment is Cambridge, with almost 14% of the population cycling, another 7% on foot, so a fifth travelling fairly healthily. Uh, our next competitor is the Isles of Scilly. <laughs> there's, there's, there's only 186 of them, so if we let down a few tyres, 
Uh, around about April 2021, before the census is taken. But anyway, there is a quick win to second place. And then a rather more difficult uh, climb to be done to beat Cambridge. Um, but it's not insurmountable, but it's, it's a big, big, big gap. Uh, and behind us is Hackney. And I'll show you in a minute how fast Hackney is catching up. And it really would be an embarrassment to be beaten by Hackney. Uh, then there's York. And the good news is York's on the way down. Well, only for us it would be good. Um, and you can see the rest of the list and some idea of the rates and the, and the absolute numbers, which are not huge, uh, really, compared to European norms. Here's the change. And this is really the important thing. All these red areas have had a fall in cycling. Okay, because in some ways London and other ways Oxford are kind of ahead of the times. In much of the country, people, many families, have only just got their second car. They had to cycle um, before. Also, people are not letting children cycle now in the way we used to cycle. Um, so you see this every October when they turn up here. And the reason why they can't cycle is because it's the first time they've cycled in their lives. And then, it's wonderful we've got all the overseas students, but of course, it's the first time they've cycled on the correct side of the road in their life. <laughs> um, anyway, you're seeing falls across most of the country. Luckily, the rises in London, which are dramatic, and the small rise in Oxford and the bigger rise in Cambridge and a few other areas is enough to mean nationally we have an overall rise in cycling. But it's not... It's not a good national uh, picture. I think we're going to get... This is the last table. And so Cambridge up 2.2% in a decade. Isla Silly is up 1.4, but that's only a couple of people. We're only up 1.2, so we're not doing well. Hackney, 4.2% rise in just a decade, which <coughs> is why they're on course. York going down. And if you look across the line from Oxford, you'll see... A 2.4% drop in car use, matched by a half of that is an increase in bikes and an increase in walking. Mustn't forget walking. Everybody's a pedestrian. Um, not everybody's a cyclist, not everybody's a car driver. We're all pedestrians and we keep on forgetting walking. At this point, I will not say anything else about walking and really annoy anybody from the Pedestrian Association. Um, but it's, and of course, walking is actually better for you than cycling because it uses um, more energy. Cycling... I'm afraid I cycle and you can see the effects on getting thin. I would do better to walk, but I'm, I'm an impatient person. Um, enough numbers. Enough numbers. <coughs> Let's just show you the north of England to make ourselves feel good. Uh, so quickly learn the map of the north. Got that? Good. You like my students. Very good. Quick. And now it's York. Okay. That's Hull, which used to be good, and is flat. That's Edinburgh, where maybe the tram tracks will put people off. Uh, and all of these, you know, this is, this is Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, over to Manchester, Liverpool. Less than 1% uh, of, of people. Um, so the country which thinks it's got a cycling revolution has actually got a cycling revolution in the same part of the country which swung to the Labour Party in May 2015. You know, it's, which was central London. And you can get things very, very wrong if you just judge things by what's happening in Oxford, central London. You need to go to Nuneaton and ask who's using a bike in Nuneaton uh, to see it. Last map is coming up. Far too much text about the numbers, but nationally it's gone from 2.4% to 26 Because of those increases in the 20 areas, you can add another 0.1% if you include all the people who mainly work at home or occasionally cycle on the bike and so on. Um, but we've got small falls in many, many areas. And faster falls, I'll show you in a minute, here. For some reason, the East Coast is really falling quite fast. And, and, that, and that is people getting <coughs> to be able to afford a car for the first time or two cars uh, for the first time. And no rises. No rises in the north of England in cycling overall. So if you want a kind of social reason to try to increase cycling in Oxford, it, it's showing the way for other cities and what might be possible. <coughs> the last bit of detail. It's quite remarkable 
I did kind of wonder whether people from Poland really don't like cycling, but I won't say any more <laughs> about that. Um, but that's, that's the picture. And only a census can tell us this picture. Traffic surveys are not good enough to tell you about what's happening to biking in North Keveston and so on. Right. Okay, here. Now this is the one important thing. Get yourself a copy of Connecting Oxfordshire Volume 4. Who's read Connecting Oxfordshire Volume 4? Great, we got a few people, okay. <laughs> you see, you, you, yeah, you won't be, you will be normal to get yourself a copy. Okay, the local transport plan, 2015 to 2031. The cycle strategy, and there's quite a lot on cycling at the front. Um, and the bus and rapid transport strategy. And, it's, and it starts off, it's got some lovely words. I do apologise to people who were involved if they are in this. It is nice, but I'm going to take a bit of the mickey of parts of it. These are wonderful words. Visionary cities such as Copenhagen and Amsterdam have led the way by showing that cycling is the solution to many of the 21st century travel problems. We aim to go further. This is Oxfordshire. This is the official plan for Oxfordshire. We're going to go further than Copenhagen and Amsterdam and demonstrate that cycling can transform travel throughout Oxfordshire, not just Oxford, Oxfordshire, this is the county, and not just in and around the city, and we're going to include disabled people on bikes that disabled people can cycle, which is brilliant, if we do it. And that's, that's, that's the worry when you read further. So, and there are nice pictures. There are nice pictures uh, in there, except because I know about cycling in the countryside, um, and I'll tell you why a bit later, that is what you don't want to cycle on in the, in the countryside. That is absolutely awful to cycle on, uh, compared to, some of you can perhaps guess where I have spent 10 years cycling in the countryside, but it was a bit nicer than, than that. 13 pages on cycling, 71 pages on buses. 13 pages on cycling at the front, I kind of call it cycle wash, it's like green wash, uh, and the serious stuff is the bus stuff, and in a way the car stuff. And you get the feeling that whoever produced this report, and I honestly don't know, it's official report, knows that they're supposed to talk about cycling, but their heart isn't in it, or somebody's heart <coughs> isn't in it. But it could be in it, and there's a way in which they could do it which would be really, really, really cheap. And I think we need to do things at the moment that don't cost anything. Um, because we don't have very much <coughs> money. Now here's the key, and this is, this is what's promised in this report. By the end of the tax year 2015-2016, so how many weeks is that? <laughs> how long have we got? <coughs> okay, <laughs> well, about six weeks. So write a letter to Ian, whoever's in charge of the county, um, <laughs> with your suggestions. He's got six weeks and to not break the promise. By the end of the 2015-16 tax year, the county will identify and complete the first CPR route. That is a cycle premium route, including at least one audit of the route. The route's going to be audited in six weeks. This one, which as far as I know, has not yet been identified, with users, and there'll be subsequent detailed design work of the route. And here's the words, you're going to get sick of these. A cycle premium route has to be safe, it has to be direct, and it has to be well signposted. So that's, that's what actually has to happen. That's on page six of the county report. To be followed, what gets even better, the promise, by the completion of another three cycle premium routes by the end of the 2016, so 2016-17 year, that's only 13 months away, and a costed plan for three more cycle premium routes this is safe, direct, and well signed purposes routes to be delivered in 2017 18. That's seven routes within just two and a bit years that we're going to get. And as far as I can tell, as yet, none have been identified. So the question is where can we put them? And how, <laughs> how, should, how should they be? Um, this is a bit jokey, and I do joke about these things, but something's going to go wrong there soon if it hasn't already. Um, I mean, of course, you make mistakes planning. But I, I frequently am in that kill box uh, there, thinking, 
somebody gave somebody a degree in planning who designed that. Um, and I think it's fair enough for me to think that because I'm sitting on a bike in the middle of that, uh, of that box. At least when there's four of you, it's fine. It's when there's just one of you. If you don't know, this is a direct route from the train station into town. We're not as bad as Cambridge. Theirs is absolutely awful. If you've ever cycled from Cambridge train station into the town <coughs> and watched yourself being squeezed by a bus, it's bad, but it's not good. OK, we've got to design these routes, and we know there's a problem because we don't currently have safe, direct, well-signposted routes. We have parts which are good, and, and the city is much, much better uh, than it was when I was a child. I, apparently, I made Ian Hudspur very happy when I spoke here last because I was talking about how better it was to have cycle routes drawn onto pavements and all the rest. Um, but now we have this plan, so we can be much better again. This map is by Richard Mann, I should say. It's a lovely map. The blue is the actual kind of safe cycle route to take if you value your life um, to get through various parts of Oxford, and you can get hold of that. So it's the map I'm going to use as the background to say where I'd suggest you, you put these things. Remember, we've got to come up with seven of them. Um, I wouldn't suggest putting them on the existing routes because they already exist. They're not that direct, and it would be quite hard to make some of them straighter and, and bigger and so on. I think they're great. They're in the bag. My favourite, of course, is the little one from Marston, which you currently can't take because it's flooded. Don't anybody cycle back that way tonight. You won't make it. Um, but they're, they're in the bag. They could be improved, but they already exist in the city. So where, where would you put your first premium cycle route? On B4044. Go on, you've got to tell me. See, I, I grew up as a cyclist, so I don't know the road numbers. Where is the B4044? Botley. Botley. Botley out to Ancham. You may beat me. We should, have, we should have done this by... I'm going to show you mine, and then, then we could crowdsource it and do better. <laughs> Here's mine. Oh, well, this is, and this is because for five years I cycled on this twice a day. So I think it's fair enough. My premium cycle route is there. <laughs> OK? Now, what's the reason for the arrow? Uh, the reason for the arrow is, is this is direct. There are a lot of people trying to get from here to here. If any of you have cycled down Headington Hill recently, you'll realise you have to cycle into the road because of all the rubbish that's on the cycled lane. And, of course, you'll know that as soon as you get two of those buses crossing, you're in trouble on this road. So I would make this a cycle premium route, but you need some more space. Now, there are a couple of ways of getting more space. One way is to demolish some of the houses and, you know, Headington High School for Girls <laughs> on the edge, um, w w which could be fun. The other way is to turn the traffic into a single lane of traffic. Um, single lane of traffic can only go one way. I'm not a transport planner. I'm probably going to annoy anybody who is. But single lane of traffic can only go one way, and it's called London Road, so why doesn't it go to London? Right, I promised you irreverent. It has to start off somewhere, so you go that way which means that if you're trying to get back in another way, you've got to find another route. Everywhere has to be accessible by car and lorry and van because everywhere needs things delivered to it. But it doesn't have to be accessible at any great speed. In fact, the slightly more complicated and difficult it is to get there, the more people will choose not to use those routes and to cycle or walk or do something else. Now imagine if you had only one set of traffic all going in that direction, all going at 20 miles an hour, because that's all they could do because they can't overtake each other, with those, with those buses heading out to London, you've suddenly got an enormous amount of space either side of that lane of traffic in which you can have people cycling, two or three abreast, overtaking each other and feeling safe. Now I'm going to leave it, I know the big argument amongst people who are interested in this is whether you have a little ridge like they have in Copenhagen and separate the bikes from the traffic or not. And I'm very happy to completely admit that I have absolutely no idea what is good there. All I know is that if you don't create space, you can't have your route. And this is, as far as I can see, the cheapest possible way to do it. Because all you need is some white paint and some signs. The signs are the most expensive thing. Do not underestimate the cost of road signs. 
uh, when people try and get 20 mile an hour zones in, it's the cost of the, of the signs. But it's, it's some paint, it's changing the traffic regulations, and it's some signs. And it means that when the buses come back from London, they've got to come in another way. Now, it's only six weeks. I'm not expecting you all to support this, <laughs> and you can't do it on your own. Uh, but we've got another six to come up with. So here's my second one. OK, it's the Ifley Road. Actually, yeah, it is the Ifley Road. <laughs> it is the Ifley Road. Uh, coming in that way. Downhill, so the buses can come in that way or go out that way. And again, you've got all this space either side of the traffic uh, in which people can have cycle lanes and you can feel safe for cycling. Now, this is difficult to take. The minute you see this kind of thing being suggested, you think, oh Lord, it's only going to take me an hour to do that journey that I normally do in 45 minutes or whatever. <laughs> it actually takes you in the bad traffic. Um, it's as mad somebody doing this as it would have been somebody in 1968 standing up and saying, why don't we sort out this little road here by having no buses and no cars on it whatsoever? And if you imagine in, in 1968 or even 1978 saying, let's have no buses or no cars on Corn Market, people say, oh, that's impossible. They say, OK, we can get rid of the cars eventually, but you've got to have the buses. And then they'll say, and you've got to have a free market in buses. You've got to have as many bus companies as possible, <laughs> which we had. And then eventually, I don't know what happened. I left the city. I come back, I find you managed to get the buses out. I don't know who did it. I'd like to congratulate them. <laughs> but, but somebody did it. And it's the same with bringing in one way on major arterial routes. It'll seem mad, but then for one generation, it'll be what actually happens. You can guess the next one. Okay, Abingdon Road, going south, when there isn't water on it. Um, I'm just slightly worried about the river at the moment, going up. And this does involve quite a detour for people. Here's the next one. This is the end of uh, financial year 2017 now, by the way, if the county are going to keep their plan. They may come up with something else. Remember, they've promised seven of these things. So if you live here, as my little brother does, and you want to get here, and for some reason you want to get here in your car, because you've got to pick up something quite heavy, you have to go down here, round here, in here, round there. <laughs> right? sounds, sounds appalling, reducing your freedom. On the other hand, if you live here, like my little brother does, and he wants to teach his five-year-old to cycle, wants to cycle in with his five-year-old into here, he can do that now without cycling on the pavement and worrying about people talking about him cycling on the pavement and all the rest of it. There is a limited amount of space in Oxford. And currently we give an amount of it over to cars and to car parking, which I don't think we should do. The next two are easy. Somebody's going to guess them. Yeah. Why hasn't that happened already? Uh, that, um, I don't know why it hasn't happened already. It's almost too, it's almost too easy, isn't it? Um, so they are, they are, they're easy. And now number seven, and you can, you must be able to, can you guess number seven from what I'm doing? No, I've left that. That might be selfishness, because I live near there. And I can't face the idea of anybody else to go one way on it. Um, yeah, here we go. Now, slightly different. Uh, neither that way or that way, but actually just cut off at a couple of places. So you can still get into it because things have to be delivered, the shops need stuff and so on. But the idea of going all the way into town, all the way out of town on the Cowley Road, just has to go. And the reason I say it just has to go is because I cycle on it quite often. <laughs> and it is just deadly. It's awful. Um, and the only way, one way or the other, doesn't work. Also, when you've got seven of these and you need an odd number for the loops to work, um, you, you, you have a couple of places where bikes can go, but cars can't anymore. And it just isn't worth your while travelling in or using that. Um, and then there's a question about the buses, and that's a bit trickier. And about whether you make poor people here who are already having to wait for ages because the bus is now so slow, go a loop that way and come back from the bus that way and round. If all this <laughs> just seems fanciful to you, 
let me show you somewhere that's already done it. And this is not Freiburg, and this is not Amsterdam, and this is not Copenhagen, okay? The place that's already done it is Sheffield. Um, and the trick, the trick in Sheffield <laughs> is to make the arrows really small, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right, can you see them? They're, re they're really little. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then it doesn't look at all frightening. It took me a very long time to work this out for 10 years of living in Sheffield. No matter how I drove into Sheffield in my car, I always ended up having to drive out the same way, into the, into the same area. So I might drive, I don't know, drive down here, and I ended up coming out here. I couldn't get across the city. They'd also put, you remember me talk about the Cowley Road, you see these little black lines? There's quite a few of them, that means your car can't go that way. Um, in Sheffield, you only drive into Sheffield if you need to be in Sheffield, not to go through it, to collect something heavy that you can't carry. I don't know what visionary thought of doing this. Um, people in Sheffield are completely used to it. You go round the ring road, uh, round the middle of the city, and this is a very, very dense area in the middle of the city. This is half a million people live in Sheffield. So what's that, twice Oxford, more than twice? And the middle is densified because all the new flats have, have been built up there and there's 60,000 overseas, so overseas and home students are in there, 60,000. So it's, it's a very great number of people, just like Oxford. Uh, but it exists. And of course, they also have trams. I'm not going to say anything about trams. I quite like trams. Trams are quite expensive and they solve it for a few people when you really want trams. Remember, this is no money. This is a bit of white paint, a bit of will, some signposting and convincing people who think the world's going to end if they can't, they can't do that. Um, now what would happen? What would happen to Oxford? Why, why are you doing this? Why, why would you want to make cycling safer? Um, you know, it's a bit healthier for people. It would be great if there weren't quite so many cars. It would make it easier for crossing the road for pedestrians. It would certainly make it safer for students. But, but what's the point of, of doing it, really? Um, and it isn't just to make things slightly more pleasant. If you did have a city in which those main arterial roads were not killer roads, which they are at 30 miles an hour, uh, if you're over 65, and you cross one of those roads and something hits you at 30, you've got about a 47% chance of dying. Uh, if it hits you at 20, you're probably going to survive. That. And here's, there's my little cutoff for the county road. There's the flowers. It's whatever, it's what else changes in the city in which people will feel they can cycle. Because many other people start to cycle, and in particular children. Parents will not let their children uh, cycle routes that they don't think are safe. So, okay, Charwell does particularly well in his school with one of the highest rates of cycling in the country. It's because it's on a cycle track. Um, and also because the traffic's so bad that parents can't face sitting in it <laughs> trying, trying to get there. Um, but let's have a look at the schools of Oxford and just think what, would, what could happen in future. Because Oxford has lots of problems. Oxford has a housing problem, which I'll talk about a, a briefly a bit later, um, but it's got a problem with its schools. Uh, Oxford has a degree of educational inequality between its schools that is possibly the largest in the whole of Europe, <coughs> between the destinations and what happens to children in the most privileged schools and what happens to children in the least privileged schools. I'd be very interested if somebody can come up with a city where the bottom quarter of children by outcome falls so low compared to the best off quarter of children by outcome. Now there's all kinds of things you can talk about and think about doing. I quite like the idea of the state schools of Oxford being a single school with a single, single senior management team. It would then make sense to have a senior management team to me. And if it was a single school, you can move the teachers between the sites. And lo and behold, you would suddenly find that the teachers here were not mostly under 24 years old, as far as I can see, whenever I visit. And the teachers up here were not in their 30s and 40s, where it's a little bit easier, because every so often you move a teacher from here to here and so on. 
But that's the teachers, and this is a long way in the future. But what about the children? At the moment, children, it only makes sense for them to go to the nearest school because it's not safe. But this is only two miles. So supposing children could actually move between sites, then you could think of not quite so rigidly allocating children to schools in the way we do, which any of you who are parents of my age, you'll know, there is a £100,000 house price, house price hike at every catchment boundary. Yeah, that's what's really happening. And the catchment boundaries aren't really the catchment boundaries. Um, the catchment of this school is the entire city. It doesn't need a catchment boundary. 28% of children, just 1,000 children, getting five GCSEs, A to A to C. If we go forward, there's Gregory the Greats, which I think used to be St Augustine's. Uh, there, I've put the other names. All the schools down here had to change their names since I was a child. But Gregory the Greats, 47% five GCSEs, 1,257 children just there. There are spaces here. Spires, 739, 739 if you believe the Oxford Mail. And the rate averaged over four years is, is 58%. So it's not bad, but it's enough to frighten quite a lot of parents. There's our Cheney. It's only 1% higher. No wonder these two are rivals. Um, but look, it's higher than that. So it's now 1,400. 1,400 children on the same size plot as when I went there, as half as many. Um, you know, it's quite staggering. And the babies of Oxford are all born down here. That. Let's go forward. Oh, sorry, go back again. Uh, just about to add, Cheney very cleverly has got Barton Parks in its catchment area. Uh, what is it? I've forgotten how many flats but and houses. It's just a lot. Yeah. And those children, they've got to somehow squeeze onto that site. That doesn't really work. There is the Charwell. <laughs> this is my one. This does annoy me. I'm absolutely <laughs> sure it was Charwell when I was growing up. Um, if I can achieve anything in the next 20 years in Oxford, that that is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> if I take the mickey enough, you think well, work, they could even have a uniform. Well, I don't like uniforms, but anyway. The Charwell, 1,867. Slightly ridiculous. Right? We know why. I mean, this is with chucking kids out at 16. 72% uh, get five... A to C's. If you don't get five A to C's in Charwell, you don't stay there at 16 because it's an academic school. Um, and I'll try not to get in myself in trouble. There's going to be a new free school. Thankfully, it will not be the Toby Young free school. Could be down here, which would be interesting. I just have a feeling it's going to be there. We had to find out soon because how long they got to build it? They've got about 18 months. So presumably they have identified a site. Or is the site still not public? We don't plan anymore. It's a free market. You know, it's great. People have babies, they have children. You begin to work out you're going to need another school, and then you make parents bid. Uh, anyway, there may be another school somewhere here. There may be a school down here. And lastly, we've got one more. There we go. Um, apologies if I've missed out. I'm only doing the state schools so far. Um, apologies if I have missed one out that I should know about in just a second, please. Now, and Matthew Arnold, of course, is the winner, interestingly, which might explain why Charwell is. You've got to get four Bs and four Cs to stay in Charwell. It's a new kind of cut a slow wall, but I don't want to get myself in any more trouble, but it, it, it's unnecessary. And it's all about the catchment. Now, the catchments can be defended because it makes sense for the children to go to the nearest school because it's not safe for the children to cycle further but make Oxford safe to cycle. And if you wanted to be really radical, you can do what they do in a really radical place. The really radical place is Brighton, and you could do a lottery. It would, of course, destroy the housing market of part of Summertown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the house that I have got huge mortgage on, I would instantly have negative equity. Um, but I'm a fool. It's a price I'm worth paying for a more equal uh, city. But none of these kind of things. I'm not saying this is a good idea or a bad idea. What I'm saying is at the moment we have a city in which the children of the city are trapped in various quarters because it isn't safe for them to move around. Let alone the pensioners of the city, let alone the cyclists who are more timid cyclists, let alone those students who won't go on a bike, 
because they don't, they don't feel it's safe. Now there's one problem, if you're going to move all these children around, let them move around, you can just let them move around between lessons. You know, if somebody wants to run Russian A-level, you can only run it in one place in the city. And if you want to say the Charwell is the academic school, fine. But let somebody who wants to learn Russian cycle up and do it in the academic school. Um, but it's a bit far. I mean, you, what you really need is a hub school. So the question is, where is the hub? And there's a terrible school, which is doing very badly. Its rate of GCSE passes is 0%. And it's the hub. I'll show it you. It's, it's just there. <laughs> um, <laughs> presumably, they're doing something else. I can't believe. Oh, that's they've really fooled the parents. Um, <laughs> officially, Oxford Mail, 0% of children get a GCSE at, at Magdalen. Uh, only 869 children, which is probably quite a lot for a private school. But is, and I think I've never met, I think it's a him. I don't even know it's a him. But apparently the head of Morgan Maudlin is quite progressive about wanting to work with state schools. I don't quite know how progressive, um, but willing to give up a bit of bike parking space and, and so on and help my new idea of moving things through. My reason for worrying about cycling is not to create my new Maoist-Leninist vision of education in the city. It's just that, well, it might be, but that's long. <laughs> it's just that so much is simply not possible. Uh, while you have this kind of gridlock going on. Um, let's talk about Oxfordshire, because you might be annoyed that I haven't done that yet. Here's, and this may be the funniest fun bit, and I'm going to zoom through so you can ask some questions. Uh, as far as I can, s well, this is a quote, there's going to be a major new north-south highway corridor linking Didcot on the eastern side of the Science Vale with East Oxford. You may have missed page 48 of the report. Um, this is wonderful. Potential new, reach, new road link and Thames River crossing... There'll be bus priority on it, so it's all kind of a bit green, but there'll be a lot of cars. Bus priority means there'll be something other than buses. Well, it will be North Didcot, past Cullum Science Centre, connecting to B4015. And here it is. So if you look, and this is, the, this is from the plan, it's page 40, 23 of the plan and 45 describes it. So I don't know how many of you have read the plan noticed this. Did you? Anybody can put their hands up? Very faint little blue dashed line, you didn't notice? That's a road. It's a new road. There's another one. Now, I kind of think somebody's thinking that, but maybe not. But maybe they are. And the fun thing for me, because I don't particularly like roads, I don't think adding another road actually reduces traffic. We know what's happened in Newbury, Newbury Bypass. It actually didn't help. Although it did educate a very large number of young people in how to do protest, <laughs> which is what they did. <laughs> And what's wonderful about this plan, you see one here, one here, presumably to be built at the same time, is I live here and I've got a garden, and George Monbiot lives here and he's got a garden, and there are other people here who live a garden, so you can put a tent on the garden for the young people who are going to want to put themselves up in trees and things and stop the diggers. <laughs> and we've got an opportunity, because Newbury was actually quite hard to get to and it was a bit tricky to be in a camp in Newbury. We, and if you remember, Cambridge had the M11 protesters, uh, they actually, they did dancing and they danced in dresses on the M11 motorway while quietly had a pneumatic trigger underneath the dress. Oxford has never had a chance to beat the M11 protesters at Cambridge or the Newbury Bypass. And this gives us time. Uh, I'll stop being irreverent, but <coughs> roads don't help. You know, it's as mad as saying you're going to put a tunnel underneath the wine cellars. Um, <laughs> for that. So... So, but what's in the plan? Forget what's actually in the back of the plan, which might be the real plan. Go back to those first 13 pages of the plan, right? Cycle super routes, even better than cycle premium routes. Uh, these apparently also have to be safe, direct and well signposted in and around Oxford. Um, and there is some talk about science fail and so, so on, but not much about where they're going to be. So I'm going to be really quick. Here's my suggestion. Uh, and it isn't what you might expect, because it's not from the ends of the one I said earlier. It is from the ends of these current cycling routes. But the key thing is it's heading off into the countryside. Because there's no need to put a cycle super route next to a main road in the countryside, just so you can maximise the exhaust intake of the cyclists. <laughs> uh, in New Zealand, they've measured this. You've, you don't have to put bikes very far away from exhausts not to do that. Why you might think of doing them there? Um, well, it's pretty. This is the Peak District. The Peak District outside Sheffield is covered in these, 
This is a proper surface, not like that rather sandy, nasty surface in the, in the report. The ex-railway lines are even better and flatter. You can cover a countryside area with routes that are only for cyclists. It is very green, very nice. That's the kind of thing you're looking at. We're never going to get the Derwent Dam, you know. But we have got Blenheim. I mean, there are actually quite a few nice things you could go to. There are actually quite a few swanky manor houses out there. Um, I was looking on Google Earth, thinking, how, where would you put this? Um, and now this is for fit, young, probably men in the main. Um, but, you, I know. <laughs> Who lives where? I, you'll see the line is drawn very roughly, but, but here's the key thing. And it, this is tongue in cheek slightly. Um, but one thing I miss from the north is not being able to take my kids out and cycle in the countryside uh, safely. Cycle ways and paths have to be direct. It's a real effort to drive to cycle another five miles because somebody decided you've got to have a loop around the Rothschild estate. Right? It really is annoying. On a car, okay, it's a bit annoying, but you're not physically doing anything. Whatever you do, and this is 20, 30 years in the future, you have to go straight from one place to another if you want people to actually use it. These kind of things now radiate out of Copenhagen for 20 kilometres, 30 kilometres into the countryside. But they are so far ahead of us. Let's zoom forward. And of course, the other reason for doing this kind of thing is it allows you to have more housing. Not much more housing, but a bit more housing, because we can't have much more housing at the moment because we couldn't cope with the cars. But if you can make it a more cycle-safe city, then you can have a bit more housing on the edge. This is the 1948 plan saying why we couldn't have housing. All these tashed areas are areas where you can't have housing. Last audience participation. Anyone you want to guess why no housing can happen here, 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 particularly here? What, what was the reason given in 1948? Wasn't the green belt then? University. Wasn't you? It's not flooding. Flooding's another colour. <coughs> no, no. Okay. Anybody else? Is no, it shocked me when. They, okay, here's the reason given in, in the plan which they originally constrained Oxford to the shape and size it is in the key. These were areas which cannot be economically supplied with the following services. <laughs> Sewage, water, electricity or gas. <coughs> that was the reason for constraining Oxford to the size it is. Or the reason that was given. There was an earlier 1927 plan which was much bigger and circular, but I don't think it applies anymore. That's all I'm saying. But what does stop you having some houses on the edge outside the ring road is a lack of a safe way for people to cycle in because you can't add any more. The buses are saturated. You can see that at Carfax and you can't add any more cars. Lastly, a couple of things about cars and then we'll end. Um, I do drive my wife's car. Um, people might say, what are you doing about cars? And I've talked about other countries and what they do in other countries and it shocks me what we don't know about other countries. Um, you're most likely to die in Oxfordshire if you live in a rural village. Actually, the children are the very affluent who have the highest rates of car deaths. And this is the thing most likely to kill young people in the county. Between the ages of five and about 25. So if you want to learn what they do in other countries, uh, they s find people according to their income. Daily Mail reports this. Uh, Finnish motorist, £80,000. A man who did three times drive uh, his Ferrari through a village in Switzerland at 85 miles an hour, 180,000 pound fine in 2010. Uh, but the biggest was only 2014, half a million euros for a footballer driving in Germany without a license. Um, and he paid it without complaining. Now, he was fairly well off, but he knew there was no point in complaining. I, all I've been talking to you about is about what might happen in 20 or 30 years' time. Within the city, we could do things faster if we wanted to. Getting to a point where we say that certain forms of behaviour on the road is this intolerable will take us longer, but all we need to know is that it is normal in the rest of the mainland of this continent to do this kind of thing, and it really does alter people's behaviour. 
We did do a little bit of this in the 1970s and it's all gone. Uh, and lastly, so please think of some questions. Thank you to those of you who I emailed. So I tried not to make a complete fool of myself about not knowing what the plans were uh, for cycling. And if you've got very good eyesight, you can read the proctor's notice asking the young gentlemen of Oxford, the young students, to be somewhat careful about their parking of cars in the city in 1968. Um, thank you very much for att your attention. Uh, please ask me a couple of questions. And we'll finish at eight. A hand over there. Um, Oxford is a log jam of vehicles at the moment, and there needs to be a better solution for everyone. Uh, and there needs to be a better vision for what kind of Oxford do we want mm. in the future. You know, one that's a good economy, uh, great universities, everyone's happy, the air quality is good. So, so why is it that we lack uh, sort of leadership to move us forward to a better society, a better economy, and a better place where we can get about the city through cycling and walking? Because if you build greater infrastructure for vehicles, it just fill up with people living in a cheaper out-of-town location and still wanting to get in by vehicle. So greater vehicle capacity just won't solve the problem. So why, why is it there's a real lack of um, vision and leadership in a holistic sense to combine health, air quality, environment, economy, social inclusion, and all those things together in, in one overall vision? It's, a, it's an interesting question, um, and it's funny coming back and sort of seeing and asking, you know, what's happened and why haven't things happened compared to places where they have. I think we've got the wrong boundary. I think the boundary needs to be bigger. So there's, there is one person leading a council and a set of councillors of what is actually part of the city. doesn't include Matthew Arnold, doesn't include Kidlington, doesn't include the area where you could expand. And then there's another person leading a county who has to worry about voters in Henley and Banbury and so on, um, who doesn't have to concern themselves that much with the centre of the county. And it's the boundary that is wrong. These boundaries were drawn in 1974. Um, and it, you, could, you, know, you could imagine a particular charismatic individual comes along, uh, my money's on the deputy leader of the council because I quite like Ed, but you never know. Um, but I don't think, I think the circumstances are so difficult that no matter who you had, the constraints are so high. And there are also people who want nothing to change. You know, there are preservation societies, there are vested interests. There are, I mean, you can ask the question, so I'm not going to try and get myself in trouble here. But I spent uh, three years living in Leeds before I went to Sheffield. And the answer to the question about why doesn't Leeds have any trams was the bus companies and what the bus companies did to make sure that Leeds didn't get a tram because that would be disastrous. I've got no idea what happens down here, um, but there are also other vested interests at, at play uh, going on. And the other thing about the city or changing it is <laughs> the city is, is held deep in the hearts of people who came here at 18, had their formative years for three years, and look back and say it was wonderful, even if it wasn't. Um, and it's their childhood. And the difficulty Oxford has, and like any other place, is that they are the High Court judges and the top politicians and the top journalists and the BBC mandarins. You can do what the hell you like to Glasgow or Newcastle. Central government isn't, isn't going to stop you. Uh, but, but you try and play around with Oxford, it's much harder. But that's why I just think, you know, some white lines and increasing the traditional bicycle, you know, politically ought to be easier uh, than other things. And it's a start in a time with no money. And I agree you want much, much more vision than that, but it gets your air pollution down. Um, it makes it possible to think about, well, <sighs> building apartments on the edge of the city, retirement apartments with views of the city, for people to move to who are currently in family housing in the middle, who want to stay in Oxford, I'll, I'll get myself my f this morning, uh, this afternoon actually, I was up on Hinksy Heights, looking at the view from Hinksy High for golf course. Uh, there wasn't anybody playing golf as far as I could see. <laughs> there was nobody, 
but me and a couple of blokes I was with looking at that view. Nobody's seen the view. Who likes views the most? Or who's forced to look at views? It's somebody who has to spend a lot of time sitting in the front room of their living room. Why don't we have apartments so that people can see that view of Oxford? And like 25% of Dutch pensioners, it's a nice shallow slope actually cycling into the city. It's only a mile, less than a mile. You do need to build a little slightly raised cycleway to get over those floods. <laughs> okay? But you could do that very artistically and I concluded at the end of my fantasy you could get with those power lines and it would be better. Um, actually, to bear my interest, I, I'm, I'm a pensioner and I cycle a lot. I live just off the Ifley Road. I would love there to be much better, wider cycle lanes both sides of the Ifley Road. But I confess I also quite often get the bus back from town out along the Ifley Road. Yeah. I wouldn't like it if that now takes me half an hour because it has to go up to the Ring Road and back in again. Yeah, you'd have, you'd have to go in, in a loop. You can't have both. This is, this is the problem. You can't have both. So you need to look at the number of people who can be on buses and the, the equivalent number of people every one hour who can go up and down on bikes. Um, and it's just working out the overall cost-benefit. You know, will you be able to make it more accessible to more people, including people who are disabled but can ride a bike that's fitted for disabled people? Does that make up for the fact that on one of your journeys you're going to be going round in a loop and it's going to be another... 20 minutes or half an hour. However, get it right. Remember, you're, you're doing these things in loops. If you get this right, the traffic should actually move. Because at the moment, quite often, I suspect you're sitting on your bus journey and your bus is not moving very far at certain times of the day. Um, another one? Gentleman at the back. Yeah. You put a different context. You talked about all the schools becoming one school yeah. and Oxford needing bigger boundaries. Shouldn't we actually now be looking at a county level rather than a city level. <coughs> yeah. We've yeah. got two engines to growth in Oxford, both of which appear to be completely out of control. <laughs> They're the two universities. <laughs> Those and the spin-offs, all the wonderful new high-tech enterprises, are what is really fueling the growth here. Why are we allowing them to? Vista or Didka both have better public transport than Oxford. Yeah. Why don't we look for university campuses in Vista and Dicker, and really say, OK, yeah. we value Oxford. Oxford has actually got good geographical reasons mm. in terms of Whiteham Hill, Shotover Hill, Falls Hill, that it doesn't expand beyond, and a couple of floodplains. Mm. Rather than trying to squeeze more growth in, why aren't we looking county-wide? And of course the cycle routes matter, yeah. and the high-speed bus routes. But surely actually nearly trying to squeeze a bit of housing into Hinksy Heights and having people like me in front of the bulldozers isn't really going to get you very far. No. You've also got the roads. Um, Oxford is incredibly small for the largest town between London and Birmingham. Yeah. And it's small because it was constrained since the 1970s. You've got, you've got to ask yourself what size city makes sense. The problem is it is not an ever-expanding one. So what I like about cycling is it limits your sprawl. Yeah. There will only be that few people who are actually willing to cycle very far. If you base a city on the bike rather than the car, you, c you constrain its size. The original 1927 plan was circular because it was designed uh, for the bike, which was the main mode of transport in 1927. It's not just the universities. The hospitals are a massive growth industry uh, because of ageing. Um, the county is actually filling up with old people who are moving in the rest of the county. We've, we've got one of the biggest rises in the population is the elderly uh, coming into Oxfordshire. So, and it's not just the hospitals, it's also publishing, and it's not just publishing, it's also Formula One, and it's not just that, it's, you know, what's left of that car factory with 3,000 workers is producing 1% of our entire manufacturing output of the country, which is the mini. Um, and that's before you get onto the nuclear things and the rest of it. Um, you can't do everything here. But we've just opened up a second train station so we can also provide a home to Harley Street doctors. Uh, and we've also allowed a housing boom to get out of control in London to the point it makes sense for people to try and live here because it's cheaper than London, even though it's, the ratios are higher. Um, 
So that there has to be a limit, but this is a very, very small city of size. I mean, what I'd like to see for those cities is, is fast, rapid transport on the railway. Every five minutes, uh, a train from Didcot, a train from Bicester, so you really don't feel, you feel like you're in the same place. Um, and I think that's, that's the way to connect those, but that requires some serious planning on what you're actually going to do before you electrify that line, which is about to happen in the next few years. But I'm not a planner. Uh, you know, this, and this is, the question though is, why hasn't Oxford and Oxfordshire used planners? Right, we've just got one question there. One question there, one gentleman at the back up there. So there was a hand raised over here. Nobody? Right. This gentleman's here okay. with the blue. I'm going to take you back to basics, Tony. Mm. You talk about this <coughs> site taking uh, road space to put cycles on. And you're saying that the traffic goes in one direction. Yeah. But the sites is surely going both directions. Oh, yes, they're going both. They're yeah, going I'm both on the side. picked that up because yes. someone was talking Sorry. about cycling out here and then going round the loop on the bike. It's a two way cycle. Yes, it's a two, two way cycle, one way traffic. Right. Yes, yeah, right. so, sorry. Clear that up. Yeah. Everybody understands <laughs> that. That's what Boris is doing in London. Yes. Two way cycling. The second thing I'd like to ask you a question about really is can you justify the expenditure? I know the yeah. principal super, but the expenditure where who's going to be using these super cycle routes during the middle of the day? <coughs> Who will be going on them? Yeah. Women going shopping? I've done a Danny there, I'm sorry. But who are the people who are going to cycle during the day? The peak hour, I see yes. the problem. Students getting in and out and yes. people going to work. But during the day, I think that the usage of these things could be quite small. We, you How need are going to get past that argument? Um, well, it, in, in a way, if nobody wants to, to travel during the middle of the day anyway, it doesn't matter. What matters is what's stopping people travelling at the time they want to travel. Children have to get to school when the schools start. So if you can't sort out your transport systems so children can get to schools at 8.35, it doesn't work. Children will leave school when school ends. So whatever you do at Oxford, it has to work for those times. And then it has to work for the times when people are trying to get in and out of work. And it doesn't at the moment. I wouldn't mind if the whole of Oxford was empty in the middle of the day. However, I mean, there is one thing for the middle of the day, if you really want to know. Uh, we're a tech second tier tourist site. Right? In the whole of the world, the, the middle class is rising. When you become upper, upper middle class, what you do is you go and visit another country. And the place you visit is London first of all, and then Paris and maybe New York. And after you've done that, you go to the second tier site. Second tier site is Oxford. Oxford has no idea of how many more tourists are going to be coming in the next 10 or 20 years here. There's no way of stopping them. You know, unless we manage to kind of hide our history and pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> Oxford is not geared up for this influx of tourists that are going to happen, and this, this rises everywhere. It's well worth planning for them, because you can't stop them. I grew up here, so I have a sense of dislike of what it's like to push through crowds of tourists and language students. Um, but it would be possible to move and spread them around the city far more than we do. We could stick them on bikes that they could hire and go for a little cycle. We could charge them for hiring those bikes from the train station. And then we could charge them for the cream teas in my college when we open up the gates. Uh, and if we charge them for the cream teas, and every college, by the way, can have a sorting hat. We can all be Harry Potter, because <laughs> none of them are. If you can charge tourists for the cream teas and the rest of it, you no longer have to rely on philanthropists to pay for the upkeep of the buildings. Uh, and that would be a much more pleasant situation to be in uh, than the one I think many colleges are. And, and so the middle of the day, I would have tourists on higher bikes, maybe penny farthings even. <laughs> uh, in the, the gentleman at the back, if you could hand up. Sure. So no. many questions, Danny. That was really interesting. Thank you for um, answering giving us some, some insights. I'd like to just ask you more about these cycle routes outside mm. the ring road because very much um, the county's plans are for cycle routes <coughs> within the uh, ring road because whatever. Mm. But those cycle routes in particular are interesting because if you look at them, they're about an eight mile uh, distance away from the, uh, the ring road. And that's the sort of distance that people are driving to get into Oxford because those cycle routes don't exist at yeah. the moment. 
you got any idea what proportion of those people who are driving into Oxford's park and rides would choose to cycle? I get not many at first. So this is a slow, you know, this is this is twenty or thirty years. Um, it's next generation. It's next generation, but it's pleasant, it's different. This is something to do on a Sunday. I need some help from you lot because you I know mean, I've come back here. Um, Whitehorse Hill um, down there has been worn smooth by the feet of people. Christmas Common. So many people walk on Christmas Common now uh, that it's crowded. Where the, what the hell do you do in Oxfordshire at a weekend? Where do you go? You escape, you drive out and you go to the Brecon Beacons. And part of the reason, you know, for this kind of thing is I think there are a thousand lakes in the county. Uh, if any of you know, I won't say who they are because it was breaking the law, a couple of friends of mine who are now retired, uh, they try to swim in all of them. Uh, and apparently what you say when somebody comes up to you and says, I'm a f uh, can I help you? <laughs> Appar apparently what, what people come up and say if you're a pensioner swimming in their lake is, can I help you? And the correct answer is, no, I'm perfectly okay, thank you. <laughs> um, now, I'm not trying to encourage the skinny dipping of pensioners in lakes. But <laughs> Well, you could, you could do. It, it's just, if you look at the Peak District now, you'd never predict that the Peak District, because all the railway lines, which were beautifully flat, had to close because the industry closed. But of course you turn them. Now, we're not quite as flat as those railway lines, but it's pretty flat. Uh, and I, I just like to know what is in this county. Um, and I'd like to cycle past it um, to somewhere else, rather than always be sitting in a car. <coughs> yeah, so it's just, um, it's regards to the one-way routes out in and out of the cars. It seems to me that the Banbury Road and Woodstock Road options would be s relatively easy. Why wouldn't you do those first? Uh, good point. Yes, <laughs> you should. It was, it was just my loyalty to London Road. Um, <laughs> th th there's also a difficulty, and this happens with speed bumps and so on, more affluent areas always get everything first. And they've already got, I haven't told you my real revolution, I'll, I'll tell you that. I don't particularly like the ring road. Um, there's a little bit of the ring road at the very top there that's quite pleasant, which is a boulevard of trees and slows it down and is safe to cross. Um, you know, one day maybe the rest of Oxford could have. Yes, you'd, you'd start with that. It would, make, it would make much more sense. And then it wouldn't seem mu as much of an imposition when you pick next. The other thing I haven't mentioned at all is what the hell you do in the middle there because you have to be able to get <laughs> vehicles there. Although you do not need uh, the somewhat supercilious young man from my college who turned up at the start of term with his van and demanded to be allowed in to unpack his, unpack his stuff. Um, and I've never watched a uh, college porter do a better job of explaining to a young man that there was no way that we were going to open the college gates for him uh, to do that. So it's another form of education. <laughs> but so, so the, the middle at the moment, you, you walk around the middle of Oxford, N New Inn Hall Street is where my college is, and just see the amount of vans and cars and people backing up. Um, it's not pleasant. You watch people cycling to the train station. <coughs> Two buses come outside Gloucester Green, and Kiddies, 18, 19 year olds, are skidding their bikes in between two buses with just a metre either side. There's absolutely no need for it. But you never have two buses crossing. That's why you have a one way system. Um, because the buses are too big uh, to fit safely in the city with the bikes. But you want to get there in a pleasant way. You don't you know, want to annoy people. You do it bit by bit but you have some idea about what, where it is you're trying to get to, what is it, what is it you're trying to achieve. Um, and if you don't have that idea, then you end up piecemeal adding another small housing estate, another small housing estate, and not thinking how is all this going to connect and what's going to actually happen in the middle of the city as you add bit by bit more and more to the edge. And much more importantly, as the population density increases, as more and more people squeeze into houses and they're all trying to get onto buses or in. So you might not be building any more houses, but you're getting a lot more people. And in some places, an awful lot of people are actually sleeping in those bedrooms.
That's how they can afford to be in this city. And you see them on the streets. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah.